Welcome to the Ostrom Avenue podcast. Basketball's long done, to be honest, but we got to wrap it up for you. And also, it's our 100th episode ever of the Ostrom Avenue podcast. We're so excited to get to triple digits. We can't wait to bring it to you with my co-hosts, Johnny Gadamowitz and Ethan Frank. I'm Ben Schulman. Guys, it's been a bit of a hiatus for me. Uh, I'm back for the swan song, but how are you doing, Johnny? Good, all good, Ben. Happy to have you back. I know it's been a uh, you know been a couple weeks now, I guess, with the lacrosse kind of you know kicking into high gear. But have to you know put a bow on this hoop season, this disastrous hoop season that it was. But good, happy to be back in studio and uh, ready to rock and roll. Ethan, how about yourself? Yeah, it, it's good. I'm, I'm glad Ben is back. Today is a celebration. And yes. I think that's what you have to call it. <laughs> We're going to go through some memories. I mean, as the newest member of the podcast, oh, yeah. I want to hear, I want Ben to go back into the Ostrom Avenue archives. The archi- is that sure. a thing? The Ostrom sure. Avenue yeah. archives? Yeah. And, and tell some stories about the early days <laughs> of the podcast. We were doing some math before this. And what do we figure out? This is your 89th 89th episode. episode. Crazy. Yeah. There's been 100 Wild. episodes. I've been on 89 of them. Yeah, which is nuts. It felt like the podcast, and, and of course we'll get into it more. It felt like the podcast had been going longer when I joined it. Uh, I didn't realize how much of it I've been a part of, but it's crazy. It's, as we'll discuss, it's a lot different looking than it was uh, two years ago for sure. One of the founding fathers, yeah. you could yeah. say. Well, I, I will say, we can get into that in a bit. I will say, I, I would recuse myself from that. I would call Brendan Mortensen and Owen Valentine. Fair the enough. Fa- but I'm kind of like in the original trio. Correct. I I'm, think if, let's say this podcast is still a thing, which I'm sure it will be. A hundred years from now, oh, yeah. they'll oh, reflect yeah. back and think of Ben Shulman as yeah. a founding father of the Ostrom Avenue podcast. Very inside baseball. Not something the listener's going to care about that much. But <laughs> I'm, I'm making an Ostrom Avenue Bible, uh, which will go to all the future members of the Love Ostrom that. Avenue podcast. So that should be fun. But let's get to basketball first. Uh, a bit of a delay. A couple things came up. You know, we're all over the place. Um, and spring break is there, and lacrosse is heating up. So we wanted to step back, kind of an emotional, weird end to the year, uh, where they kind of almost make a run, and the buddy punch happens, and, uh, you know, the ACC tournament flips on its head, but Syracuse isn't totally a part of it. I guess just quickly, um, to recap, because I I don't want to spend too much time on it. It happened almost two weeks ago to the point where we're recording this, uh, over two weeks ago. But what a crazy ACC tournament. For an ACC tournament uh, that I personally went to and felt like it wasn't truthfully going to matter at all. Honestly, in a way, exactly like 2020, where Syracuse heads to the ACC tournament. I feel like there's nothing for them to gain here. And they punk North Carolina by 25, and then the world shuts down. This time, not quite like that, but they punk... Florida State by 40, and then their world shuts down because Buddy punches someone. So... I mean, a lot more happened than I thought would happen, guys. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I mean, I could. I don't think anyone saw Buddy punching someone. That no one saw that. Legitimately, coming. no one even actually saw it with yeah, their own two eyes. So Only that saying, one camera. When did you realize that that happened? So As I'm, was there. I'm on play by play for that half. For those who don't listen to our live sports coverage, we we divide it up. But I'm on play by play. I so I'm locked in um, to everything. And I just didn't see it. The, it, it. Whatever happened, it was an offensive rebound. I don't remember the play exactly. There was a kick out in a big three. And so whoever hit the three, Joe Girard or whatever, I'm looking at him and talking about him. That was the focus. Yeah. yeah and then So you, did you find out on Twitter? Was so that... I didn't know it was a punch. Yeah, right. I found out on Twitter after the game. Um, right. I, I was just, frankly, just calling the play. And I'm fairly excited and, and yelling and and. Who, and Jaron May, who was doing the game with me, taps me on the shoulder and points below the bucket. And he didn't know what was happening, but he knew why Wilkes was down. Yeah. So we had to kind of slow down and be, you know, there's an injured player right now on the court. But no one totally got what was going on. After the game, uh, a, a WAER alum, who I don't need to name because why not, um, came up to me and said, did you see what happened? Uh, and at that point, I saw the video. And then I also happened to walk into the press conference post-game uh, right as a reporter. If you go back and watch the press conference, I wasn't there when he got introduced, so I, I don't know if he was a reporter for Florida State or General ACC, but one guy went in there and decided to pick a bit of a fight uh, with Jim. So I walked in on that where they're arguing back and forth. Um, 
And yeah, that was interesting. It was. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you my opinion on the suspension on this. Well, podcast. for me, what well, it's just it's crazy <laughs> that that Jim's first below 500 season is cemented by his son punching a player. Pretty brutal. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really you, you tough one. You couldn't write that story. You couldn't. No. no, because he's. I mean, everything people said about him in a way after is true. I mean, he's the cleanest player you're going to see. That's just very not uncharacteristic. Game. Yeah. yeah, he he chirps a little bit, uh, like everyone does these days. Like it's not a a crazy thing to to expect Buddy Beheim to punch a guy. Yeah. He's just so non confrontational What I will say, and we don't have to open up a whole can of worms no. with the Buddy discussion, however, it, it was frustrating in the standpoint of if that got picked up in real time, sure, maybe it's an ejection, but he's playing versus Duke, and I think that's what got people so riled up. Which, look, I think it's... I, I understand that point. I don't know. Like, I just don't know what my general consensus takeaway from it was. And I know this is oversimplifying it in a way, but nothing happens if Buddy Beheim doesn't punch anyone. There's no ref to blow a call or any. Like, if you just, it, they were up True. 18 points in the second half. And I know that sounds easier said than done. And people get angry in the heat of the moment. But if you just don't punch someone in the middle of the game, then nothing happens. And I will say, um, well, I, I want you to have your opinion, Ethan, and yeah. then I'll get to the Duke game because a lot of people have opinions about what would have happened if Buddy was there. I I still think they would have lost to Duke. I, I think they would have lost worse. I, think, I, I don't I think agree. you could play a you better game never, yeah. you will than what never, they played. You will never be as motivated against well, Duke Jimmy's as you not were in that game. Right. You, yeah. would ne- you will never have that kind of fire lit under you and play with that kind of heart and effort for sure. If Absolutely. Buddy was playing. So I think you have to look at that. Everyone's like, after that game, oh, this is what Syracuse could have been this whole season. You know what? They will never play like that again. No. Because it is a once in a season, a once in you know a handful of seasons type of situation that happened. So you will never have that type of motivation again. But yeah, I mean, a theme of not just the ACC tournament, but the NCAA tournament as well has been awful officiating. And, yes. And that yeah. has been a, a not just a complaint from like one team. It has been across the board. It's yeah. almost it's everyone. almost been so widespread that it's like fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's just exactly. everyone's the whole thing hit. is so, a crapshoot. So, I, did was the situation handled poorly? Yes. And I think the most telling thing is okay. You know, Buddy gets suspended because the officials miss a call. Why don't officials get suspended? I think that's what people are most upset about. There's no punishment for the people who actually put Buddy in that position. And obviously, what he did was wrong. I don't think anyone is arguing that he punched a player. You deserve to be punished for punching a player, but it should go both ways. That's fair. That's fair. In my mind, it's clearly a flagrant too, because um, it's. I mean, it. You know, he punched him. Um, but I think we've we've hit enough on that for Buddy. Uh, you know, hopefully this doesn't become something that overshadows a lot of his career. Um, I know it. It doesn't feel like it's going to. Uh, but also our, our good friend and someone who I think this podcast liked a lot, at least when he was at Syracuse, Frank Howard, unfortunately lives a little bit with how his career ended. Uh, we don't need to get into that. A little that. bit of a different cir- circumstance. A li- different mm. circumstance for sure. But my point being, I hope the the last thing he does isn't the you know the thing that we remember Not him by. Not too much recency bias. Yeah, because yeah. at the end of the day, he's one of the probably you know, top 10, 15 sco- peer scorers uh, yeah. in the program's history. Uh, so, yeah, interesting end to the season. We're discussing the end of the year here on the Ostrom Avenue podcast. Johnny Gadamowitz, Ethan Frank, I'm Ben Schulman. Check us out at Ostrom Avenue Pod on Twitter. I kind of wanted to do one thing, look toward next year. There's some players uh, that could be on the fence in terms of returning or going elsewhere, and I feel like we all settled by the end of the year that that was the biggest factor to why Syracuse wasn't good this year was the transfers in didn't match the transfers out. Right. So I just want to run through a couple guys. Kind of, do you you know do you want them back if you're on the side of Syracuse, and do you think they're going to come back? Do you think it makes sense? Um, and I think maybe the most interesting guy to start with here, uh, because it was up in the air last year, and again it probably will be this year, is Frank Anselm. Yeah, I had a um, feeling that's the road you were backup to go down. center. Now everyone's talked about two Quincy Ballard, the Florida State center, Syracuse native in the portal yep. too. 
How does that complicate things? So, Ethan, you want to jump in here? Yeah, what's, what, I, what's your feeling on Frank? Do you want him so and should Syracuse that, want that him? That Quincy Ballard question is an interesting one because I don't think there's a spot for him if Frank Anselm is still here. Then you have – You can't run you're three not, Right, you're not going to yeah. play three centers. So, if Frank leaves, then I think there's an obvious hole because Peter Carey is not ready to come in and be a backup center. And, obviously, Jesse Edwards was expected to return. That was formally announced or reported yes. yesterday. But yesterday, as in Thursday, we're recording this on Friday. But – if, there, if Frank Anselm decides to go, then I think there is an opening to bring in a backup center, whether that be Quincy Ballard or someone else. I think Ballard would be a good fit. He's a big guy, seven feet, good, long wingspan, you know, athletic. Mm-hmm. So I think that would be a fit. But Frank is interesting because he had his moments, but there are also times he really struggled. And he's just not ready to play more than 20 minutes a game. He needed Jesse to be that guy, and then he came in as the energy guy. Yeah. He couldn't bring that energy right off the top. He was good for short spurts. We saw it. You were at the game against Georgetown. He came in in that middle. He was that awesome. He and, dunked yeah, on Matumba. Yeah, exactly. I remember that, and, and that was one of his best moments. That game against Virginia Tech was great, but nobody remembers it because Syracuse blew it at the end. Yeah. So I think it's interesting, but I hate to deviate from your question, it's but okay. I think once we get an answer from Cole Swider on what Cole Swider does, every other domino falls. So you think Frank's decision could be reliant? Because I, I, I think for Frank, everyone's it's, decision I feel like it's is reliant on Cole. I think everyone is reliant okay. on Cole. Interesting. Well, if you're Syracuse, do you want him back? Can you answer that? I can, and I think it's a yes. Because yeah. if Cole Swider is not back, do you know who the most senior forward on the team is? Is Frank even a forward? No, it's Benny Williams. Benny would be yeah. the eldest forward yeah. on the team. John crazy. crazy. I don't count him. <laughs> John, uh, John. All right, Johnny G, what, what do you think? What worries Johnny, me is that, you know, I, Ethan, you mentioned before he was the energy guy. He was the short spurt right. guy. I think that's his ceiling. Like, I don't think, especially on a team that has Jesse Edwards on it. Well, would you have said that about Jesse last year? That he, Wouldn't you have said the same thing? And that's fair. And I will say, in eight games where Frank was, where there was no Jesse, you know, Frank twice had 15 rebounds, once had 10 rebounds, had eight rebounds another time. Like when he had his opportunity, he was he made the most of it. Absolutely, I I think for Frank though, it might be kind of a situation where look, maybe he's read the tea leaves. Jesse Edwards' impact on this team, I think, is only going to increase next year. I'm not sure. If, you know, you don't want to speculate, of course, but I'm not sure if it's the type of situation that Anselm is dying to return to. If it is a very similar minutes distribution, I think it can't hurt if you're Syracuse. I think you obviously. Obviously, it's nice to turn to him. We, we know the foul trouble narrative comes in time and time again, so he's a nice, reliable option when that rears its ugly head. But I, I don't know if Frank himself has a desire to do another year right. of what he did His this offensive year. game is just not there yet yeah. for him to no. be a reliable player. No. And he can come in to spell Jesse because there are going to be games where he gets into foul trouble. And obviously, Jesse is not competing, able to compete with some of the guys who outweigh him by a significant yeah, number Frank's of Frank's a pounds. better rebounder than Jesse. Frank, Frank is, he one is a better rebounder Frank than Jesse. Frank is a little more fluid on the defensive end, I would say. Yeah. Jesse's a better shot blocker, but I yeah. think Frank is the better athlete in terms he's of— stronger. Yeah. You know. He's more physical. Yeah. Um, but he's just not there offensively in the way Jesse was, finishing at the rim, free throws, stuff like that. I feel like we're kind of at a consensus. Uh, and again, like Johnny said, we're not trying to claim we know what guys want to do. Um, oh, we I know. Think, yeah, we know. <laughs> we know. Um, I think Syracuse would want him back too. Um, I think he's a, he's a good backup center. Like if yeah. you if you had told me before the year this is what we were going to get out of Frank Anselm, I, I would have taken it. I, I think what they got from him this year was good. Uh, again, like you said, I, I kind of agree. I don't think in the ACC he can play over 20 minutes. I don't think they need him to play over 20 minutes. No. If I'm Frank, though, and this is just if I'm Frank, I probably leave. Uh, I just don't see what the point is. There's a but high where, chance. But where is he going to be a starter? Like, well, is, he so a, is he a power five? It depends. Starter? A non-power five. That's right. what I would do. I would go to a non-power five and start. That's my personal philosophy around it. Um, then again, Robert Braswell went to Charlotte and played 20 minutes this year, and they right. weren't even good. Right. So it's, you know, the grass isn't always greener. Um, it just feels like the role Frank had this year is going to be his role for the rest of the time at Syracuse. If that's what he's comfortable with, maybe, maybe like after next year, Frank could start. But that's saying that everything's going fine for Frank and that no one else has come in because the transfer portal could affect it any year. That no one else has come in that has passed him. I feel like like that's kind of how we're feeling about Frank, that he could maybe want to go 
But at the same time, Syracuse might want him. I'm going to move on. Uh, you brought up Cole, so I think yeah. we got to talk I think, about it. Yeah, I think Cole, Cole is the most important. For people who don't know, uh, Cole was kind of out the door, or so we all thought. Jim, after the Duke game, said his his wonderful truth, which was that everyone said before the year, being the Bayheims yeah. and Cole, that they were only here for one year. year. Again, I mean, I don't need to bring it up. We know that's not true. Um, yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Bayheim literally filed a petition, not to mention – this thing I'm about to tell you, which is that Pete Moore, the SID, in a response to someone talking about there not being that much returning talent, named Cole Swider as, quote, returning talent. Yeah. Then they walked eligible it, to return, yeah, perhaps? Then they or... walked it back a little bit right. and said he could return. Now, if you go read the tweet, which I believe has since been deleted, it wasn't worded like he could return. That's not how it sounded. It sounded like these are the guys on the roster. Yeah. We haven't heard anything official. Um Look, is anyone here not feeling like Syracuse wants Cole back? I, I don't. Think I think so. yeah, you would want you, Cole. I back. would rather you have need Cole. another scorer would, as currently need, constructed. Should, you, so I would rather have Cole than try to bring in someone else from the portal. Yeah, Agreed. well, and you can still try and bring in someone right. else. I think this is something that anyone who's anti him or or when Jimmy was talking about anti them coming back thinks coming them coming back means they have to play the same or a bigger role. Right. If you get better players. I mean, this isn't going to happen, but put Cole on the bench if you get better players. Like, don't get me start. wrong. Cole will start. He will start because yeah. they're not going to. But bringing more talent in doesn't mean you have to. Like, if you don't like Cole Swider as a main player, they don't have to play him there. It just makes sense to have him. Yeah. Um, you will can, he you come can't back? roll. Yeah. You can't roll into next year with, with Joe Williams. and Jesse being the only sure things. And, and yeah. you can throw Benny in that yeah, conversation. Which is not too. a sure thing. Right. Not a sure thing. Um, it's. I mean, we can try. It's so hard for me to to speculate on whether Cole would come back. Like, I don't. I don't know. He ended yeah. the year strong. He did. Um, Do you think there is a sense of a little bit of unfinished business? I not, think so. Not that this team was knocking on the door at any point during the right. year. Because he he really started to click in late February right. and March. Exactly. So I I think he was feeling like, oh, I can build on this next year. He, him, and Joe will be the main scorers on the, the team. The throne is open to, to right. for like who is the leading scorer, right? You know? Absolutely. Exactly. And I think in his eyes, he sees that opportunity, and I think he's going to take it. I, I, I think it's definitely a, a very realistic possibility at this point because I, I don't think he's put himself in a position to advance in basketball no, right I don't, now. I don't think so. However, and I, when I say advance, I'm not just talking about NBA. I'm talking about Europe and all these places. It, look, the NBA could be far fetched, but if he comes back to Syracuse, scores fifteen something, you know, fifteen and a half, sixteen points per game next year, like that could get you a, a G League exclusive contract or a European contract. Um, so I, I, I think it makes all the sense in the world that he comes back to college. Then again, though, we just don't know what else is out there. He could easily transfer. I think. I don't think he would want – well, again, we don't know what he would want to do, but I have a tough time visualizing him going through that process yet again because Fair. the first few months of the year it right. was, okay, what is Cole Swider's role on this team? Where does he fit? For him to up and go and land somewhere else and have to go through that all over again, especially when you consider the way that he did end this year and it kind of felt like he had a good thing going, I think I'd be a little surprised. I think it's either he's back to Syracuse or he's done altogether. Is there anyone else um, that you think we're gonna we're gonna put John Bolajak to the side? Is there anyone else that you think has a potential here to join the transfer portal? Well, uh, I mean, it has to be Benny. Yeah, I think. If Do you Col- think it's realistic? Do you think there's a, a shot that he goes? I think there probably. I, I think there's a shot with everyone. Okay. But, except for probably Joe. Uh, yeah. but, I mean, <laughs> what would he be leaving to? Right. He's the, he's I, the guy. I think if Cole decides to stay, then I think Benny probably has a decision to make. Um, but I don't see why if the, I, I, I've been thinking of a comparison for Benny in recent days, and that is to Jeremy Grant. Um, Jeremy Grant did not play that much. His first season, that team went to the final four. So it was a little different. Team was different. The team was different, but then in his second (laughs) season, he absolutely exploded. They're from the same area of the country. Um, Similar body types, you know, six, eight, long, athletic, Grant, not much of a shooter. And Benny, not really much of a shooter. He had his moments where he knocked down a couple shots. You know, you were at the Duke game, Ben. You saw that. Yeah, that was um, crazy. But I think if he's able to really have a really productive offseason, he could take a huge leap, like, like Grant did. And I just think the body types are so similar. And I, 
taking that leap as a sophomore where you have a senior forward, you know, Grant had C.J. Fair along him on the other side. That was a senior. Cole would be a fifth-year player and more of a scorer. And Benny, like Grant, would be more of you know the defensive, long, athletic player. Yeah. So I think they could complement each other really well if Benny's able to improve his game in the offseason. I don't know what you think about well, that. Well, I'll bring up something that Ben said on this podcast a couple weeks back. You know, for Benny, the, the leap has to come soon, right? Because you mentioned something about how the leap – needs to come between years one and two. Once yeah. you get to two to three, three to four, most times you don't see that much of a drastic improvement. So I, I think for Benny it's a situation where, we mentioned it before, it's wide open, right? Like there is not a guy on this team, and I'm not suggesting Benny can be. However, the opportunity is there. I, I think you bring up a good point, Ethan, in that if Cole does come back, he certainly has a decision to make. But I don't think Cole coming back necessarily hurts him too much because there are spots up for grabs. And you mentioned the men- Mentorship as well. So I don't think he would have a whole lot to pursue elsewhere. It's not like he's coming off of this stud freshman year where I'd imagine he will even be getting a, a ton of looks, to be honest. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see as time goes on. So, yeah, I just pulled up the numbers. So Grant was a little better as a freshman. Yeah, he still averaged, not great. He averaged four points a game. He did play in all 40 games. He averaged, he, he played more than better. Right. He averaged played four points better. a game. 14 minutes per game. So Benny averaged two points a game playing 11 minutes a game. So like yeah. it's a little similar in that, but it, the athletic profile is so comparable to me yeah. that I think if you really put in the work in the offseason, I think if he, he – Autry is his guy, is Benny's guy. They are always working together pregame, him and Demetrius Nichols, who joined the staff this season. I think if Benny's really able to put in work – something interesting to, to me, though – he was not on the bench for either the Miami game or at the ACC tournament after he was hurt. And Pete Moore did say he was dealing with his injury. Yes. But I'm really he confused as to what this injury is because Jim Beheim said on his radio show it was only like a, a four-week injury. So what could this injury be that caused him to not travel with the team? That, that was really interesting because Jesse's been at every game. Yes. After he his injury, so that Jesse's was a injury li- was upper body, right? Though, as opposed to lower. lower. Obviously, we don't know exactly what it is, but it was a little confusing, and I I won't even want to say a little concerning that he was not on the bench. It's fair. That's fair. Um, I think that's all I got on this team. I'm yeah. trying to I'm trying to think. I don't think there's much more to say. The you know we could do transfer talk, but so much of that stuff isn't unfolding right. yet until the tournament is done. So I feel like. You know, for a second here, I know Syracuse isn't in it, but guys, pretty fun tournament. Um, the worst bracket I've ever made was this really? year. Oh, yeah. I could get the numbers. Any um, of your Final Four still alive? I think I actually have two of my four Final Four still alive. Let me see. Uh, I got myself into a pickle last night. What'd oh, you yeah. do? Because in my bracket, I picked Arizona. But in the spread pool I'm in, I have Houston. <laughs> so that was randomly assigned, so obviously I can't control that. But Houston, I mean, I'm all in on the Cougars. Oh, I love the Cougars. And obviously we know what I they did the to Cougars. Syracuse First last hand, year. First hand, yeah. Um, How are they a five seed, by the way? They, uh, they could be a two seed, I, easily. They, they're number two on Ken Pop yeah. right now. Yeah. No, not, it's not, ridiculous. not a number two seed. Number, number two, two overall. overall. It's, it's they're the highest ranked team <laughs> left on Ken Pop. It's the second It's the second year in a row where they've just been brutally underseeded. Like, I, oh, I don't they were even, a two seed last year. Um. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't even. Why did I think they were a four seed last no, year? No, they were a two seed. Eh, whatever. Um. Well, uh, they are fun. They I'm offensive all in rebound on like crazy. I'm in on Houston too. Um. I don't. I don't know. Well, this will go up before the game. Uh, I on a real sports uh, betting show here on campus. I put a bet on St. Peter's to become yes, the first 15 seed to ever win three How about games. That Duke parlay last night. Duke parlay. <laughs> And my Duke alternate oh, total yeah. hit. That was huge. Jeez. And my Duke alternate total. At only total 29 hits. points at halftime, I was worried for you, Ben. Dude, I was. I honestly forgot about the point total. I looked up at the end of the game, and I was like, oh, my God, we also hit the total. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. You um, really cheated the system with this parlay, though. Did I? It's a loop. I, did. I mean, well, you so basically picked the I same did. bet twice. I did, but and you got such a good. I think it's genius. I can't believe genius. Fanduel no, would let you do that. No, if you're going to take genius. the plus one spread, yeah, it's absurd. If there's a spread within basically two points, basically you pick the money line twice. Yeah. yeah. If there's yeah. a spread 
spread within two points, you, parlay yeah. the money line in the spread. That's yeah. what I think. Like, yeah. there's no, Might as there's well. no reason not to. That was the thing. I had to take a spread in money line from each part of the region for this show. And once I saw plus one Duke and I was going to take it, I was like, why wouldn't I just yeah. that parlay very, that? Very, very smart move. For a non-savvy better, I have to say. I'm a terrible, terrible better. Um, the ACC, good. So maybe we shouldn't have well, been so down. What do you so mean you're down. a terrible better? You won Ostrom yeah, I was going to say, did yeah. Don't be yeah, too yeah, hard on yourself. Hey, let's let's get yeah. up for yeah. We haven't had an episode. Well deserved. After a terrible football season, he really needed it. Yeah, I will say, yeah, football was brutal. I was 5-7, and and I ended the year, like, barely in double-digit losses. Um um, I will, to give these two guys credit, I will say that I was broadcast exempt for uh, most of the high leverage games of the season. Uh, so it might have been I'm a little I'm just proud I was able to come back and get second place after What that, a crazy that. season. I was in last. At, oh, no, you were in last I was for in a lot last. Of I collapsed big um, to Johnny. Johnny, Johnny was in first, though, yeah, yeah, yeah. for a lot of Epic the year. Joke job yeah. from Johnny. Um, yeah. Terrible. But, yeah, Not Ostrom picks. You guys doing Ostrom picks? Um... Come football season again. Yeah. Football will yes. get it back up, yeah. yes. With, so that'll be fun. With the craziness of lax and some yeah. conference, some well, non-conference. Yeah, that's the thing about lax, It's too, tough to the betting pick lax as well. I, I think a couple generations down the line, there will be Ostrom picks for lax. Yeah. But lax betting is kind of in its infancy oh, yeah. right now still. The spreads are meh. Although, uh, big deal for not neither here nor there, but ESPN uh, reaching a big oh, deal yeah. with, uh, what oh, was yeah. it, the PLL? The, yes, the NLL. The PLL. Okay, the PLL. PLL. So that should be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, more coverage coming there from yeah. our guys Jay Alter and uh, Anish Shroff, WAER alum. Um, all right. Well, this is our 100th episode. Um, I guess I'm going to kind of hand it over to you guys because apparently we want to we yeah, want to ask some early. We, we got it. Yeah, we got odd gotta, questions. I, Can I go back first? Let me find the first episode. Do you want you want me to pull up the on. guest log as well? The now, guests, Ben, sure. were you a guest prior to you? Were you Coming ever brought on, on? Yeah. No. Should I say how I got onto the yeah, podcast? Yeah. Let's, let's okay. hear it. I, I won't make it too long winded. Um, but so the podcast, for those who don't know, started in 2019, in the fall of 2019, Brendan Mortensen and Owen Valentine. Uh, this seems like a weird thought now, but they were like, hey, all these new podcasts are popping up. Why don't we do one for WAER? And they would do a podcast um, for the football season. They started in 2019. Uh, which you might remember seemed like a disappointing year at the time, but little did we know uh, it would get a lot, a lot worse. Uh, so they would do the podcast, and a lot of it was um, they would do their little talk back and forth about the game, and then they'd bring on the guys who were doing play by play for us, um, and they would talk about the game. So it was a yeah. student's thing. Um, and then when I was a sophomore uh, that year, so sometime in December, I guess they decided they wanted to add because Brendan, who was a senior, knew he was going to leave. And I got a text out of nowhere from Brendan saying, hey, and I knew Brendan, but like I was recently onto, onto you know, desk, which is junior staff for our listeners, kind of. And he messaged me, hey, are you interested? I said, yeah. Um, and he asked me for a sample. And the weird thing was I was trying to get a summer baseball job. Uh, and this Northwest League team, the Ridgefield Raptors, mm. had asked me to do a sample podcast thing for them. So I was like, kind of random, but can I send you this Ridgefield Raptors <laughs> podcast I got? And he was like, yeah, I don't care. I just need to know. Like, I know you know Syracuse. So I just need to hear if you can do that. So that was how I got on. And I went back and looked. It was episode 12 since you've been gone. Uh, January 15th, 2020. So it's been over two years. Um, and we were covering Georgia Tech to Virginia because uh, we didn't – remember, this is pre-Zoom. Right. So we went home for the break, and there were no podcasts for a month. Wow. Yeah. Uh, because what – I mean, how yeah. were we going to do the podcast yeah. without us being in this studio? That was a – a foreign concept. Um, so what what did they do then? They were not good. But the last game there was when Buddy banked in the three and double overtime against yep. Virginia. Yep. Um, so, yeah, that was how I got on the pod. Wow. So I, I have a couple okay. interview questions. Sure. What was your one most memorable and two craziest interview? Hmm. That's a good question. We've talked to a lot. Yeah. I got to pull the guest line I, I, up I on got... here, too. Do you have any ones that you think? So, I, I mean, I, one I, of the coolest interviews we ever did was Benny Williams. Right. Uh, to I, be fair. I saw Benny Williams, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of, like, we're early in the show still. We're only two years old. But right. a lot of my time on the show, we've been trying to build the show up. So, Benny was one of the most notable guests, I mean, we've still probably ever had. Um, and that was just a simple DM? That was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, for those who don't know, <laughs> the athletic department at Syracuse University doesn't give us a million guests. Right. Uh, especially players for their team. We would love to have players 
for Syracuse on the podcast. That's not how it works. Totally fine. However, they don't really have jurisdiction over players who have committed to their team yeah. but are not on their team yet. So we talked to Enrique Cruz, who was one of the yep. most fun interviews ever. Uh, he was the first player we had on when he committed, the offensive lineman who's yep. going into his sophomore year. Uh, and then Benny committed, and I was just sitting on my couch at night, saw the Benny commit, DM'd him, and he answered me back right away, and he was like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so that's probably – that was the coolest. I mean, he was a you know he's a, top, a five star recruit, like top yeah. thirty guy at the time we talked to him. Uh, we got Jay Billis to come on after the he and Bayheim stuff, uh, mm. where they the Jalen Johnson stuff. That might be the craziest one because I still can't believe he. I really appreciate that he did that. Uh, I can't believe he he did that. Very few people uh, would would come and. And confront that. I'm going to give you way too many answers, uh, okay. if that's okay. What, another craziest pod we did, uh, the Boomer Bust crossover podcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, big, I saw that. Uh-huh. big fan of our Boomer Bust friends. Uh, check them out if you haven't. Um, all graduated now, I think. Uh, what, uh, mostly graduated. Um, but uh, they they came on and, and let us know about Ify Melifonwu and Andre Sisko <laughs> and Trill Williams draft stock. Uh, so that was cool. I don't know. It's a lot of the like those were cool ones, but also you know like AJ Black. Like I know AJ Black now because right. of this podcast from Locked Boston on College. BC. Yeah. yeah, so that was cool. Uh, Ken Segura was a writer. You know, he's a nationally acclaimed writer at the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Who we got to know from doing this. West Durham, I got to know from doing this. Uh, unfortunately, no longer there. But Matt Hosworth from CNY Central, I believe, was our one of our first guests. Um, yeah. Not Deep our first here. ever guest. Our first Remember, ever guest was Max episode Chadwick. Episode 21. Yeah. <laughs> um, episode 21. Episode 21, Matt Hosworth. So that was Kevin Belby. One. That must have been a very cool interview. Kevin Belby was um, – it It was the Bayheim's Army the year before we should have uh, interviewed him because yeah. they don't win that year, but right. they do end up winning the next year. But that was a ton of fun. Paul Biancardi, ESPN's national recruiting director. I mean, honestly, when you look back, it's pretty crazy, some of the people that we've convinced to come on this podcast – um, and we're building so, a network here. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, and then the first lacrosse season ever, that was fun because we had never done lacrosse. Yep. Brendan left before lacrosse, and Owen and I just realized how good, like, relative – we get great guests for basketball and football, but, you know, we're a student radio podcast in a way. Right. It's, but a completely, lacrosse, it's completely different when you're interviewing a head coach. Yeah, we're yes. getting top guests yeah. from lacrosse. The like, access is on. Yeah. I spoke with, uh, a, a shameless plug here, if you didn't yeah. check it out, I spoke with Duke lacrosse head coach John Donowski, and that's currently yeah. posted. You can go give that a listen. I mean, we've done back-to-back years with Lars Tiffany, like the yep. national title oh, winning oh, lacrosse coach. That's my guy. Yeah, yeah. so Lars, Lars, I mean, Lars and I talked about maybe him coming in studio to do a podcast when Virginia oh, comes up here in April. Oh, my goodness. How wild would that be? That would be the greatest thing ever. You have to make that happen. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's really hard to pick. I would say when we got Benny Williams on, that that felt like the coolest, the craziest interview. Who did we – we had a crazy football interview this year. I'm trying to remember who made me laugh about as hard as anyone made me laugh this year. Um, I don't remember exactly. but Do you remember which game it was? I don't. Mm. I don't. Uh, there was talk of a big head. Um, oh, and oh, it was uh, David, David Thompson. David yes, Thompson. NC that State. Guy NC yes, is a he was the man. Yep. Yeah. So that might have been the craziest interview we've done. Yep. D- David multiple times, like, we record these. They're not live, but once we get on, we're recording. Yeah. yeah. He multiple times just stopped the interview in the middle, <laughs> asked us a question. He was, and then it was he like, making fun of the artwork. In our rooms. He made fun of our rooms. So that was great. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Hard, hard to pick. What else you got? Yeah, I... I don't know. Like you, we just went. Through, I like, went through this, all of it. Like, yeah. Those are the, yeah. the highlights. Yeah. But that's the fun. Um, I think we have so many different types of guests that that's made it fun. For I, th- I think something maybe we should future doing is like the Ostrom Avenue podcast on the road. Like maybe you know in the future there's an opportunity fun. to do incorporate like, how much we travel right, into a it. travel episode yeah. Yeah. of the Ostrom Avenue podcast, something like that. Maybe College something. game day kind of. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We did they're, do. They're, I mean, they're basically the same. There's, yeah, I know. There's one remote Ostrom in the history of Ostrom. It happened this year. Uh, Brad and I right, did yeah. one from Louisville in our hotel room. Yeah. Uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, that was the only one we did there. Uh, any other questions you got for me? I, I don't think it's a great okay, interview here's, subject. All right. <laughs> what is your goal? What do you want to see from the Ostrom Avenue podcast as you depart after this 100th episode? Hmm. Um, I don't know, just anything different, you okay. know? That was uh, that's what 
what the main, one of the main things I like about the pod is we don't get policed very much. Um, and our, you know, we're at an NPR station. Our content's pretty structured here. Um, but we don't have a ton of people looking over our shoulder. Um, so, you know, just anything different. I, I think there's a lot of – what I'm most excited about in the future is we've just kind of dipped our toes into the video world recently yeah. uh, with video episodes coming out. Like, I think there's so much room for us to expand our coverage through video uh, and do fun things and mess around a lot. So that's kind of the thing I'm most excited for, that by the time we get to episode 200. Um, you blink who, and it'll be here. Yeah. Who knows what what it'll be like? It, it is pretty crazy to think, you know, we, we go back to episode 12. I mean, totally by coincidence, I'm sitting here at Mike 1 in our studio, which Brendan Mortensen always used to sit at. Owen would sit at, at mic two. You're at mic two, Johnny. Yeah. And I would sit at mic six where yeah. Ethan was when I was the kind of the first young guy for the pot. So I'm, I'm if excited. anybody knows what that means. Yes. <laughs> I'm, uh, no one knows what that means. Have, but uh, basically I sit at the head of the table yes. and Ethan's to my left. And we'll, we'll, give yeah, yeah. On we'll give yeah. a visual on Twitter. We'll give a visual on Twitter. We'll give a visual on Twitter. But, yeah, it's crazy. I don't know. I'm just excited to see where it goes. It was, It's changed so much since episode 12. So I could imagine – that by this time next year, it's going to be so different, but also still have a lot of the same stuff that we like. So yeah. that's that's the exciting part. I, well, we're excited. I, I, I think that's a great, great roundup. Great, 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 right. great wise up. words of parting words of wisdom. Yeah. You're always welcome back, Ben. Of Thank course. you. I appreciate what, whatever that. Whatever you want. I, uh, I will say, to, to give our b- a bonus to our listeners, one of my favorite guests that we ever had, too, was when we brought Brennan Mortensen back on to the 50th episode and debated some topics for Syracuse. That was fun. Um, but, yeah, I guess as I, uh, I should be a little bit sappy here. Um, I'm not good at this stuff. But um, this is my final Ostrom Avenue podcast and the final student media I do on Syracuse's campus. Well, so I'm I glad saved, we can make wow. it. Yeah, I saved it for you guys. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I you know, thanks again to B. Morton Owen. It's nuts to think that two years ago uh, they put me on this pod. It was the first thing I did on air at Syracuse, I think, definitely at AER. Um, don't believe I had any other on-air experience here. Um, and they just kind of, you know, I mean, B-Mort's been super supportive and, like, this pod is so foreign to the pod he created, but he's never at any point, like, stopped us or anything. And Owen was was great. And, and he's kind of, you know, he and I together, you know, put our brains together to make YouTube happen and, and everything like that and social media happen. So... It's been awesome. It's been a fun ride. Can't wait to see where the pod goes in the future. But one last time, go check us out on social media at Ostrom Avenue Podcast and subscribe or give us a like, rating, follow wherever you find the podcast on YouTube, the Ostrom Avenue Podcast, Apple, Spotify, whatever you need to find your podcast. We're going to be on that platform. For Johnny Gadamowitz and Ethan Frank, I'm Ben Schulman. So long, and they'll catch you next week.